Are you in a coma? Are you alive? Those kinds of things. But the other signal below is are the spiking, that's the spiking of one neuron, their, their impulses, and that is this, the code that computers, that, sorry, the com code that neurons use to communicate to each other. That is the language of the brain, and it's our job to crack that code to understand what does that series of pulses mean in terms of, say, wanting to move. So you're listening. This is what neurophysiologists do all day long. They listen to those crackles and try to figure out what they mean. Uh, so you're actually listening into the brain. Uh, and the problem with uh, these signals, which are the information-rich signals of the, of the brain, if you want to get access to them, the only way to get to them is to put a microelectrode in the brain. Microelectrode is basically a very thin needle. Uh, you can see one next to a hair here. And it's, uh, it's introduced into the brain, and basically the tip of the electrode is a sensor, and it has to be nuzzled up very close to the cell. The cell is like a broadcast tower, and for a short distance, it generates these impulses. And the problem we have is not only do we have to put electrodes in the brain, but we have to have a lot of them because we don't want to listen to sort of one conversation. We have to listen to as many as we can get. And the way we do that now is we, we basically invented this 100 microelectrode array. As I said, it's about the size of a baby aspirin. Uh, and it is implanted just into the surface of the cortex, that peel on the outside. And as, a, as you can see there, there's a little plug on the surface that goes through the skin and brings that signal to the outside. And this is the device that we developed uh, in my laboratory. Uh, just to give you a sense of the, the scale, it's actually quite tiny. That's a penny, so it barely covers Lincoln on the penny. Now, the other big problem is knowing uh, how to make sense of these signals. You heard that was actually a movement-related signal you would never guess. It just sounds like a crackle. Basically, what happens is you can see here uh, a train of many neurons, spikes coming out. Each of those little tick marks are spikes. And basically, at its maximum flow rate, uh, if you were listening to 100 neurons or recording 100 neurons, it's like getting a 100-bit uh, information stream at 1 kilohertz. That's about as fast as it can go. So it's not real fast, but there's a lot of information there. And our job in decoding is try to relate something like a kinematic va variable, like v-velocity, to a, the spiking. And we use techniques like linear regression or other more complex techniques to map what is the relationship between the spiking we see and something going on in the outside world. So rather than spend a half an hour explaining the math, I thought I would try to give you just some intuition of the approach we take. So you can imagine you had one of these microelectrodes in my brain, in my arm area motor cortex, and we were recording while I made small movements, say, to the left or to the right of my arm. And every time I moved to the left, that neuron made seven of these spikes. And every time I moved to the right, it made two. So now you could have a decoding scheme. Seven means left, two means right. If I went behind stage and all you heard were the pulses, if you heard seven, you would guess I had just moved to the left. So that's fundamentally the way we, we look at this code. We count the number of spikes in a small time interval. It's usually about 50 milliseconds. Uh, the problem is, is that the code is not that reliable. The number of spikes every time I move, say, a little bit to the left, is not the same. Sometimes it's fewer, sometimes it's more. So what we have to do is average across many neurons, and by averaging that count over many neurons in these time bins, we actually do get a very good estimate of where you're moving your hand in space. So with all of that background knowledge, some, some knowing where to go to get arm signals, knowing what the signals look like, and uh, what kind of information they had, all done from basic science. We, we then uh, applied to the FDA and got permission to test in a, a small group of people the feasibility of them using these signals to actually produce movement. <clears throat> so there have been five people implanted. The two you see there called S1 and S3 are actually Matt Nagel and Kathy Hutchinson, or Kathy and Matt, I'll call them. And uh, if I won't talk... Uh, I, I won't show as many videos as I'd like to show, but if you want to see more of Kathy, she was on 60 Minutes, uh, where they told her whole story and, and her use of the brain gate technology. So all of the people we've implanted are all paralyzed. They can't move their arms and legs. It's a seriously debilitating condition where you rely on others completely for anything you do. So one of the big uh, issues for us was, you know, could... What's going on in the brain after it's been disconnected from the world for years? In every case, our patients were two, and in Kathy's case, nine years since they had actually moved a limb. We were concerned that the brain would be shut down, or even if they thought about moving, nothing would really happen. So what I'm going to do is let you listen in on Kathy's brain, and you're going to, the, the pink thing you see there is one of those spikes spread out in time. So that's just what it looks like, but it's only 1.6 milliseconds in time. 
or if you look slightly to the left of it, you'll see a lot of these pink spikes going by. Um, and those are the, that's one cell's uh, signal going out. Basically, if you just listen to it, you can hear the activity. And what you'll hear a technician do is ask her to imagine that she's opening her hand, closing her hand, or relaxing. And what you can hear is you'll hear her thinking about moving. And those clicking, the spiking noises you'll hear, is listening to human thought about movement. And you'll hear that when he says, open your hand, it'll be very active, and when she closes her hand, it'll be almost silent. Relax. Now imagine you're opening your hand. Relax. Close your hand. Relax. Open your hand. So you're listening to one brain cell and its signal about movement, and I think actually it, just by listening to the sound, you can tell there's information there. This is what we capitalized on, uh, and we were very excited because we knew the brain remained active, even though it was disconnected and, and cut off from the outside world. So we, we could build, uh, using all of the neurons and all of the information from different neurons, we could uh, build a decoder, and here you're going to see Matthew narrate his own uh, early use of this system. So here you can see him with the technician. Um, he's got the connector on his head. He's sitting in his wheelchair. And he's going to do two things that he's going to narrate himself. The first thing he's going to do is open an email program by just dragging a cursor over an envelope. It's not a real email program. It's one we made up. And then he's going to try to draw the world's first neural O. He's going to draw a circle with his, with just using his mind. So you'll get to see him do that. You can see him there. There's a ventilator, so he's a little bit quiet because of the ventilator, because he has to have support to breathe. Okay, so here's the cybernetics desktop. What are you going to do first? I'm going to open my email first. Okay. I'm going to open the first one. You're going to open the first one. And it says, congratulations, you are doing a great job. Very good. I'm going to open the second email. Okay. This one says, hi, we'll talk soon. Great. Now, can you exit back to the CyberKinetics I'm desktop? I'm going to exit. You can exit. Excellent. So, what's next? Next, I'd like to draw a circle. You're going to draw a circle. Wow. So, this is just a little inkwell, and he tries three times, and you can see him get better as he practices. Okay. So now we try it again a few minutes later. Alright. Excellent. So now you just try uh, going back to the You just witnessed the world's first uh, drawing of an O using only your brain. So we are interested, you know, given these, then that, that was an early sign of, of being able to control the cursor. But with uh, some improvements, we were asking. Well, what can we demonstrate that you can actually do that would be of use for these individuals? So, so here you see Kathy doing two things with a computer interface. On the left, she's using a kind of smartphone uh, typing where she's pointing and clicking at letters. And I asked her what she thought of the technology, and she's typing out, I love it. Uh, and secondly, on the, on the right, you can see her using just basically what is a TV remote control, but she's now using just thoughts to guide the cursor to the TV channel or the volume and, and being able to select what she wants to do with the TV. In addition, we wanted to know, is it feasible for people to control real-world objects? These people really want to be able to interact with the world. So we, asked, we set Matthew up with this prosthetic hand. It's a motorized hand that opens and closes, usually driven by some switch or some muscle. But here he is hooked up to... Uh, to, from his brain directly to the hand. So this is the first thing that he controlled in years uh, directly with, his, with any output. And here's, uh, you can see his reaction, or you can listen to it uh, once we start this video. Close, holy shit. Open. And let's, uh, we'll run it again because it usually gets, but I think it shows the impact. So can you back up and, and do it again? There. Close, holy shit. Open. So, 
Obviously, an important 